Hildegard malware is targeting Kubernetes clusters. Remote access flaws have been found in consumer security devices. A brief update on the spreading software supply chain incidents. Project Zero sees incomplete patches as the root of most successful zero-day attacks. Recruiting a privateer's crew. The current mood among ransomware victims. We'll search for the truth about 5G with Rob Lee and Rick Howard. And who's behind Zoom bombing remote learning? A hint... The kids aren't all right. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Palo Alto Networks Unit 42 has found a malware campaign that targets Kubernetes clusters. The threat actors establish initial access through a misconfigured kubulet, then propagate their malware, which Unit 42 calls Hildegard, across as many containers as possible. The goal of the attack appears to be cryptojacking, and Unit 42 attributes the campaign to Team TNT. The campaign involving the use of Hildegard is, Unit 42 finds, both more evasive and more persistent than those using other kinds of malware. It's well adapted to gaining access to cloud resources, it encrypts its payload, and it's able to hide its operation behind a legitimate Linux kernel process. It has at least two ways of connecting with its command and control infrastructure. It can either use an IRC channel or a reverse shell to do so. Computing sees the campaign as a precursor to a large-scale Kubernetes-based attack. Refirm Labs shares some research their colleagues at Florida Tech have completed. They looked at several widely sold home security devices, smart doorbells and home surveillance cameras, and found them rife with security vulnerabilities that could give an attacker remote privileged access sufficient to enable them to spy on the unwitting users. As the report puts it, The vulnerabilities could enable a remote attacker to gain privileged access to the devices, listen to all audio and video recorded on the devices, and ultimately use the devices to covertly spy on their users. Refirm argues that the results should move industry and its regulators toward a system of IoT security labeling. They also argue that retailers have an important role to play in vetting products for security and privacy. They scold, quote, Retailers have policies to prevent selling products that burn down your house or make you sick. How about not selling horribly insecure IoT devices that turn your house into a hacker's playground? End quote. Gizmodo last night published a brief state-of-the-incident note on SolarWinds in which it notices the spread, the complex ramifications of the known and suspected independent exploitation by both Russian and Chinese services. On the Chinese front, NextGov says that the U.S. Department of Agriculture's most recent word on a compromise of its National Finance Center, Reuters reported earlier this week, is that USDA hasn't seen any evidence that the compromise happened at all. Acting U.S. CISA Director Wales told a meeting of the National Association of Secretaries of State that CISA's found no evidence that SolarWinds vulnerabilities were exploited against election systems, Reuters' Chris Bing tweeted. One effect some observers foresee is a chill on the cyber insurance sector, or so thinks Property Casualty 360. The exposure is considerable and imperfectly understood. Software supply chain attacks pose a novel actuarial challenge that the insurance sector has yet to master. Google's Project Zero sees bad patching as a breeding ground of exploitation, CyberScoop reports. Project Zero writes, in a retrospective on 2020, the researchers call déjà vulnerability. When looking at the 24 zero days detected in the wild in 2020, there's an undeniable conclusion. Increasing investment in correct and comprehensive patches is a huge opportunity for our industry to impact attackers using zero days. End quote. Correct and comprehensive are the operative words. 
A correct patch is one that no longer permits exploitation of a vulnerability. A comprehensive patch can be applied everywhere, covering all variants. Project Zero doesn't consider patching complete until it's both correct and comprehensive. It's a failure, they think, on the part of industry to ensure that patches are complete, and this failure is responsible for the damage Zero Days have been doing. So, looking for some hackers with skills? Think your interviews aren't really working for you? Why not let them try out against a real target? Cointelegraph reports that Red Balloon Security is sending job candidates an encrypted hard drive holding an altcoin wallet containing about $4,800 in Bitcoin. If they can crack it, they get to keep the money. And presumably, they get a nice callback that could lead to a good job. It's like using a letter of mark and reprisal as an HR tool. Security firm Coveware reports that ransomware attacks are getting more destructive as some of the criminals are apparently inadvertently wiping their victims' data. In what may be a related trend, fewer organizations are paying the ransom. It doesn't seem to pay. Not only does paying fuel a banded economy, but there is no good way of enforcing the contract. The crooks may say they'll send you a key, and maybe they will, or maybe they won't. Or they may say they'll destroy their copies of the data they stole, and which they threaten to release if they're not paid. But it requires a real leap of very misplaced trust to take the hoods at their word. Still, ransomware remains a big problem, and relatively poorly protected organizations are especially vulnerable to damage. With that in mind, IBM has announced a $3 million program that would provide in-kind grants to schools, which have become favorite targets of the lowlifes in the ransomware criminal underground. Almost 60% of ransomware attacks in August and September of last year hit K-12 schools, and IBM's program represents one corporation's response. And finally, during this pandemic thing you may have heard of, Schools and universities are doing lots, most, sometimes all of their instruction online. And of course, a lot of that instruction is being delivered over Zoom. So what about Zoom bombing, when trolls disrupt Zoom sessions to deride, insult, or distract participants? It's still a problem. And why is it a problem? Well, Captain Obvious might ask, hey, do you know any people? But now there's some science behind just knowing people. A team of researchers at Boston University and Birmingham University studied Zoom bombing, and this must be understood in its most expansive sense as extending beyond Zoom proper to the disruption of other platforms for remote collaboration. They found, basically, that the problem is typically the high school and college students themselves. One of the principal investigators told Wired, quote, Our findings are basically that most of these calls seem to be targeting online classes, and they seem to be called by insiders. Students in the class are bored or want to piss off their lecturer or whatever, so they basically post details of their own classes online and ask people to join and disrupt them. End quote. At least in the French tradition of Kahutas, the students are doing their own hooting. At least in the American tradition of class clowning, the class clown personally makes funny faces and nasopharyngeal eructations. But here, the kids are even outsourcing their own misbehavior. Sad. And you, yes, you in the back row, stop doing that with your virtual face. What if it's stuck that way? And now a message from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. If you're a defender fighting to protect your organization from the dark forces of cyber attackers, it might seem attackers have the advantage. To win, they only need to be successful once. As a cyber defender, you must be successful in ending attacks every single time. Cyber Reason reverses the attacker's advantage. They put the power back in your hands. Their future-ready attack platform gives defenders the wisdom to uncover, understand, and piece together multiple threats. And the precision focus to end cyber attacks instantly on computers, mobile devices, servers, and the cloud. Wherever your organization's data is being threatened, Cyber Reason is ready to win the battle against cyber attacks. With you and for you. Join them and the world's leading companies. Together, we are the defenders. Cyber Reason. 
end cyber attacks. From endpoints to everywhere. Learn more at cyberreason.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Cyber Reason for sponsoring our show. Here in the U.S., we are under a seemingly endless barrage of advertisements claiming that 5G is here and it's changing the world in all sorts of amazing and magical ways. And yet, those who've gone out and done actual testing of 5G performance have been left occasionally wowed but often underwhelmed. Our own chief analyst Rick Howard looked into that apparent disconnect and he files this report. With the release of the iPhone 12 and Samsung Galaxy, 5G phone customers were expecting, you know, 10 times faster download speeds and a reduction in latency to almost zero. But for the most part, we are still seeing 4G performance. I reached out to Kurt Bantel to find out why. He is a senior solutions architect for Spirit Communications. I think a lot of people realize, need to realize is that we're not really on a 5G core yet. There's a lot of improvement still yet to come. As with any new tech, we're all going to have to get used to new acronyms. Kurt talks about four of them. EPCs, the Evolved 5G Packet Core, SGWs, or Serving Gateways, E-Node-Bs, the old 4G or LTE base stations, and G-Node-Bs, the 5G base stations. So the backhaul to the network is still an LTE core. It's still an EPC. And it has all the interfaces that 4G had. You know, when we get to a 5G core is where we start to get to those, you know, incredibly low latency numbers that we're looking for as we start to deploy a bunch of stuff to the edge. And I'm not a gamer, but, uh, you know, online gaming via a wireless device becomes a very feasible application that people might be using. So from your device to the E node B and G node B are presenting us with speeds that are very similar to 4G numbers. According to Kurt, the 5G networks are still deploying. Over the next few years, we will see steady improvement as network providers combine 4G and 5G infrastructure. But we are probably 5 to 10 years away before we get a ubiquitous international 5G network. When we get there, though, we will experience these exponential improvements in download speeds and latency. For people like me, I'm anticipating the higher download speeds. For Kurt, though, he is anticipating the new low latency numbers. Just a little background, I'm an avocado farmer too. And so I've been a huge IoT fan for decades because my farm is a giant IoT test bed. I have every technology imaginable pretty much deployed at my farm controlling things. So I get more excited about these low latency, small bandwidth applications for real-time control type things. I want to turn on a sprinkler valve and have it turn on. Not, I turn on a sprinkler valve And, you know, maybe a couple seconds later or sometimes 30 seconds later, it turns on. Like, it's not, this is not a sustainable bottle for me. Lots of bad things can happen if, like, a valve doesn't open in time. An interesting side benefit to 5G technology is that it will increase the competition for Internet service providers. Homes and businesses will not have to rely on fiber to the building. On one telephone pole, you might have a choice of four or five providers. We will get this from something called beam forming. The technical term is enhanced mobile broadband or EMBB. I do think that with beam forming and that EMBB aspect and getting the deployment down to be able to get into your house in a fixed wireless application, I think that's another great aspect of 5G. Like that that to me is kind of game changing too. If I can displace the two, you know, People bring in broadband to my house and have maybe a choice of six different opportunities to get, you know, the same types of speeds and the same experiences that I get off of cable or fiber. I think that's a neat opportunity. So for all you new Apple and Samsung 5G phone owners, have patience. 5G is coming. You may not be experiencing the download speeds and low latency times the salesperson promised you in the phone store, but it's coming. And you will start to see gradual improvements over time as the network providers continue to build the infrastructure. That's the CyberWire's chief analyst, Rick Howard. A 
And now, a word from our sponsor, No Before. There's a reason more than half of today's ransomware victims end up paying the ransom. Cyber criminals have become thoughtful, taking time to maximize your organization's potential damage and their payoffs. After achieving root access, the bad guys explore your network, reading email, finding data troves, and once they know you, they craft a plan to cause the most panic, pain, and operational disruption. Ransomware has gone nuclear. The folks at Know Before have an upcoming webinar that'll get you up to speed on ransomware. In this webinar, you'll find out why data backups, even offline backups, won't save you, why ransomware isn't your real problem, and how your end users can become your best last line of defense. Go to knowbefore.com slash ransom to learn more about the webinar. That's K-N-O-W-B-E numeral four dot com slash R-A-N-S-O-M. And we thank No Before for sponsoring our show. And I'm pleased to be joined once again by Robert M. Lee. He is the CEO at Dragos. Uh, Rob, it's always great to have you back. Um, I, I want to touch base and, and hopefully get a little bit of a reality check from you when it comes to 5G. And and what I'm curious about specifically is, is there a difference in what we're seeing from the consumer launch of 5G and the types of things that you're seeing on the ICS side of things? I, I hear lots of people making all sorts of claims that you know 5G is going to to make the world a better place for everybody in, in all sorts of ways. I have to say I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical so far with what I've seen from the rollout. What's your take on this? Yeah, I, I share your skepticism, but I acknowledge that the world is changing as well, right? And so every industry that I can think of in the industrial world has been talking about some level of digital transformation for more than a decade. And that's the concept of, connecting up our infrastructures in ways they haven't been connected before to gain access to machine learning and cloud analytics and, and all sorts of different um, technology enablements. We even hear about IIoT, the industrial internet of things. And the reality is our infrastructures are getting connected up. And it's not coming, in many ways it's already here, that many of these companies are taking advantage of IIoT and cloud analytics and similar. The sort of hype around it is the belief that it's going to fundamentally change everything overnight or that even it could fundamentally change everything over time. And the reality is these are organizational changes where as the organization decides to take advantage of things like hyperconnectivity, that they take on new risks and they've got to have compensating controls for that, but they also take on new value. And, and as they change the organization, it might be as simple as and straightforward as more profit, but it might also be things like access to larger workforces um, and better work-life balance for the employees. 5G doesn't really change a lot of that. I I can imagine there's going to be plenty of people that want to argue about this, and I I appreciate that, but but 5G doesn't fundamentally change things from the organizational level. Is it another technology to take advantage of? Yes. Is it potentially more dependable, therefore higher bandwidth, reaching portions of the world that maybe you know previous connectivity couldn't reach all aboard. H- happy to um, agree with all of that, but you still have to have the organizational change part to actually take advantage of those things. And in many ways, again, where we already have connectivity, it, it's not like bigger pipes are going to fundamentally then change either the risk portfolio or the opportunities in front of us, many of the applications, especially in the industrial world that we're taking advantage of, don't even require that type of connectivity. But to your question, very candidly, will we see more 5G stuff in industrial? Absolutely. I saw Siemens um, the other day explicitly talk about an industrial 5G router uh, and and connectivity source that they're they're having. Um, Will we see more companies buy new technologies that are 5G enabled? Absolutely. But yeah, to share the skepticism a little bit, just because it's 5G, I think it's getting bought into more. But I don't think the differences between 4G and 5G are really being explored when you're talking about connecting a pump or a sensor to a local system that is just now also connecting out to the internet. Are there things that you can imagine where... You know, specific examples where having this uh, increased connectivity, which having a bigger pipe, 
when that opens up um, possibilities, things that that everyone has wanted to do, but they've been unable to do for lack of these sorts of capabilities? Yeah, that, I mean, that's where I'm struggling. I guess that's a, a, a simpler way to, to make my point that I haven't seen or, or been exposed to. Um, so maybe this is my own visibility issues, but I haven't been seen or been exposed to companies that have been limited by the bandwidth. They've been limited by the organizational side of their house going, what is the value in doing this? What is the risk? Do we want to take on the cost of doing this, et cetera? It's not been a discussion of, oh, well, we really want to do this. And as soon as 5G is here, we'll be ready. Like that. I don't, I think the 5G thing is a little bit more marketing on that front. Now, again, is it going to um, change a lot of things for the, the better as it relates to like networking? Similar, maybe. And I don't want to just put down all value of 5G. Obviously, there is value. I'm, I'm just speaking from the, is, are we going to get 5G appliances and then all of a sudden things change? And the answer is no. Um, in, in many ways, what 5G is doing for a lot of your service providers, like ISPs as an example, is now you're talking about digitally you know, programmable networking instead of going through these large generational leaps. A lot of the 5G aspect is in the software kind of defined nature of it um, instead of just expecting large bulky appliances. That, that's gonna help ISPs and similar, absolutely. Is putting a 5G router in an oil refinery going to fundamentally change that oil company's business model? No, it's not. Hmm. All right. Well, Robert M. Lee, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. And for professionals and cybersecurity leaders who want to stay abreast of this rapidly evolving field, sign up for Cyberwire Pro. It'll save you time and keep you informed. Bring out your best. Listen for us on your Alexa smart speaker too. Cyberwire Podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Elliot Peltzman, Guru Prakash, Kelsey Bond, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now a word from our sponsor, Detectify. New vulnerabilities in web technologies like jQuery, Apache, WordPress, you name it, pop up each day. 1,500 plus CVEs were reported on NIST.gov in October 2020 alone. Sifting through them to find which ones are relevant, then research them, well, nobody got time for that. Detectify collaborates with leading ethical hackers to develop the latest research into security threats from hacker to scanner in as fast as 25 minutes. Using payload-based testing, Detectify automates relevant tests with proven exploits to simulate attacks in a safe way that doesn't take down production. Get hacker knowledge in your hands for security that goes beyond the OWASP Top 10, monitors subdomains for potential takeovers, and uncovers vulnerabilities you thought were fixed. Level up and start detecting critical vulnerabilities in time with Detectify. See for yourself with a two-week trial at Detectify.com slash Cyberwire. And go hack yourself. That's Detectify.com slash Cyberwire. And we thank Detectify for sponsoring our show. <laughs>